welcome to this review of my Kedis NJ98 keyboard. This was a donation from Kedis. I previously reviewed another model from them and I might do another one at a later point actually because they contacted me about a very interesting sounding magnetic one with adjustable actuation. But anyway, this is a more traditional electromechanical version like the NJ80 I reviewed before. So to quickly recap, the NJ80 was basically a keyboard that functioned much like a GMMK, except much cheaper and without missing out much in terms of features and functionality. It's basically a fairly standard hot swap chassis, but at a pretty affordable price. Not a metal chassis, it's plastic, but it does have a brass mounting plate and the finish is pretty okay. One thing I should add, which I forgot to do the previous time, is to say that I'd like it if they made the volume knob knurled instead of smooth. It's kind of difficult to get a grip on it, especially considering how much stuff is in the way around it. Anyway, the NJ98 is very similar to the NJ80 in terms of build quality, so I'm not going to go into too much detail again here, but there are a few things that are different with this model. First off is the colour scheme. Now that's not exclusive to the NJ98, they just offer a few different colour schemes in general, but the one I reviewed first had a very clean looking but maybe slightly boring colour scheme, while this has an extremely kick-ass black and navy colour scheme that made my mouth water. As we know, black and blue are both very good colours for keyboards, and this looks really awesome without being ostentatious in my opinion. I really like the look of the backlighting and the plate here as well, they mesh together excellently I think. I know it's not easy to see on the camera image, I think it's because of all the bluish floodlights and the auto colour correction on the camera, but honestly I think it looks very tasteful altogether. Rare to see that in a modern keyboard. You can also get the plate in steel rather than brass by the way. The second difference and what the model number refers to is the form factor which is a 98% one. Now I had never tried this one before and it looked pretty efficient to me. Basically it's a full size shortened slightly by cramming the alpha block and numpad into the nav cluster. Theoretically this makes a lot of sense because this part of the keyboard normally has the largest amount of dead space in it. However, while I was originally tentatively optimistic about this layout, in practice I found this to be very clumsy and not at all worth the few centimetres in Big Mac units, that's the few 1 2.5 fourths of an inch that this form factor saves. By losing the dead space here, these keys are all much harder to find by touch as the space that's normally here is extremely important for navigation and by cramming them together some of the keys become smaller and less expensive. Accessible. It's also easier to make mistakes with this form factor. Now the most annoying one which really stuck with me was where when I was spooling through a video with the right arrow key I would accidentally press or even just hit the zero key and start again from the beginning which is extra annoying because then your video player doesn't save where you were previously you have to skim through the whole video again to look it up and this happened a lot of times. So personally I think a proper full size would be a much much better choice here, but that's just my opinion of course. Plus I'm not a fan of the lead key all the way here, I'd much rather have it closer to the nav personally, something like here for example. It's also missing a few keys, not many, but a few, and of course one of them is the print screen button. Now I don't know what people have against it, but for some reason this is basically always the first one to go, which I really don't understand because I use it all the time. I even have to deal with its absence so often because of all these space saving keyboards that I keep reviewing that I bound a key on my macro pad specifically to print screen just because it keeps getting left off. The keycaps are thick double shot PBT, excellent choice there I think. The lettering is opaque so it doesn't let the RGB through but honestly I don't mind that so much. I suspect this looks nicer than it would otherwise as now it doesn't ruin the nice colour scheme as much. The lettering isn't white but more a sort of goldish colour which rhymes very well with a brass backplate. Told you, it's pretty stylish. Next, there's this little thing, and if I'm honest, that's basically half the reason why I said yes to reviewing this keyboard. So this display here shows a bunch of things, including the lock light indicators, a clock, the battery life, and even a cat. But the thing that really got me excited about this is the key next to it, labelled Cal. Yes, this can be used as a calculator. 
Now, if you've seen some of my older videos, particularly about focus models, you might know that I'm a big fan of calculators on keyboards. I used one during my PhD to do quick calculations with all the time. It's highly useful if you do catalysis on a daily basis. So I have a lot of experience with this feature and it's excellent. Focus made several models with calculators in them, so this is not a new concept, but theirs were made super crappily, which is a bit unfortunate. Now, for some bizarre reason, the Cal button doesn't actually switch to calculator mode, it just opens the Windows calculator function. To toggle calc mode, you need to press FN plus numpad enter instead, which makes <laughs> zero sense. As a bit of feedback, I'd highly suggest to Kedis that they update it so that it's the other way around. It's not like you're gonna accidentally hit this button here anyway. The screen is pretty small, but it works fine and you can have as many as 12 characters per line, which is more than you might have expected. It doesn't have any extra dedicated buttons for calc functions like focus keyboards do, but still, I like it, it's good. Unfortunately, there's no way to output the contents of the calculator to the PC either, which is a very useful feature that the FK9200 introduced. That was handy enough that it made me switch to dome with slider switches for a while. So some more feedback, maybe for a firmware update or something, is to introduce a sent to PC feature and add some more calculation features to nearby keys. Personally, I was always a huge fan of the one divided by X key, and answer key is supreme extremely useful and possibly memory keys will be great as well. You can pick any key around the numpad that you want for this because calc mode disables keyboard output anyway. Just some tips for the devs. Like I mentioned, it's a hot swap chassis and you have a variety of switch options at your disposal. In this case, it came with Kale Box Deep Sea Eyelet switches, which is rather a mouthful. It's basically a box switch with a few changes. It's a dampened linear switch with a transparent top housing for RGB transmittens, obviously, and a longer spring, which results in a flatter force curve. MX Red normally goes from 35 gram preload to 60 gram bottom out. This sits at 40 grams of preload and only goes up to 50 maximum. To translate that into imperial units, that's Google it mofo gallon feet per inch grain. In practice, it just feels like a light dampened linear switch, to be honest. These are factory lubed, and honestly, they're pretty smooth, but I can't help but feel that the magnetic one of theirs that's coming up is going to be a better option than the switch department. This is doubly true as I feel like these are too light. I make mistakes quite easily on these. It's a tad too sensitive for gaming for my liking as well, particularly the spacebar feels like a featherweight. I keep noticing that putting in stiffer spacebars on keyboards with very light main block switches isn't the thing anymore, and that's a big shame. Even a slight startle or something while gaming and you've hit the spacebar already, which is very annoying. But of course, this is super easy to fix because it's a hot swap chassis, so you can stick whatever MX pinout switches you want into it. I should add that the dampening is done with a rubber mat at the bottom of the switch. One thing that's always a key question to any dampened switch is how mushy it becomes as a result. I'd say it's not very mushy in this case, but of course it's not going to be as crisp as undampened switches. In this case, I feel like that might not be a bad thing though, because somehow I've got an inkling that these switches would be quite harsh on the fingertips if they didn't have dampeners in them. In fact, I think this is not an uncomfortably typing keyboard like this. Overall, they remind me a bit of Matthias Red switches, which are also very light dampened linears, possibly slightly lighter even than these yet. Of the two, I definitely prefer the Matthias's though. The type of weighting and the slight tactile bump just makes these feel like a more natural switch somehow. All in all, it's $145, or 130 for the steel plate version. That's not cheap for a keyboard like this, but not massively overpriced either. At this price point, you have a lot of choices, but this one does have its benefits. Again, I'm not a fan of the form factor, but that's a personal thing. I do really like the calculator thing, though, which is a very rare feature, unfortunately, and it has a killer look, I'm not going to deny that. So, yeah, check it out if you're interested. I'll put a link in the video description below. That's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.